I'm Jim Reapy. I'm chair of the Board of Trustees uh, and wanted to welcome you all here today. This is a great alumni weekend uh, uh, beginning for all of us and had some wonderful panels and symposia uh, this morning and, and some yesterday actually. Uh, and this is the wonderful tradition that we, we go through this morning, our conversation with our president, uh, Amy Gutman. Uh, in some families, of course, the idea of having a conversation uh, in the family uh, may not be the, the anything but asking for trouble. Uh, it's hard to get familial consensus on many matters, at least in my, my home it is. Uh, but I believe all of us in the Penn family can agree on a couple of things, and that is that this last year that we've gone through has been one of the most extraordinary ones that uh, our country has ever experienced, and thus our university has ever experienced. Uh, unprecedented change uh, and enormous challenges. And with that change uh, came to the university some new and very formidable challenges. Thus, I think it's fair for us to ask as we look at Penn right now, can we meet these challenges while sustaining our positive momentum uh, and remaining true to the core values of the institution at the same time? And then I think there's a second question, uh, most relevant to Penn. Can we continue to drive Penn towards preeminence uh, in such uncertain times and in, with such constraints as these times impose on us? Uh, I would tell you that my view is that the good news is that the answer is yes to both of those, both of those questions. Uh, less than five years ago, Amy, as our new president, shared her vision for the university and set out a plan for Penn to be a model for teaching, uh, for research, and true engagement with both the local and global communities. With sure leadership and very careful planning, we've already achieved many of those milestones, and there are many more on our sites. Uh, and Amy will share some of those with you uh, today. I want to just say something very carefully here about uh, the future. I'm stepping down a little bit later this year as, uh, as chair, so this will be my last opportunity to address our alumni uh, body uh, on this great weekend of ours. And I would just say that you should be extremely proud, uh, very proud, of what your university has become and the stature that it has achieved. Um, its accomplishments are enormous, uh, and for those of us that have been around a long time, we stand in awe of uh, where the university uh, is today uh, in higher education. I would tell you that two things make the difference, leadership and alumni support. Uh, and we have been fortunate to have both of those uh, in spades uh, during the last decade, decade and a half. Uh, and so therefore, I think we've been extremely fortunate these last five years uh, to benefit from the enormous talents of our current president. We're very lucky to have her here. Her vision for the university matches her ability to execute on that vision. So I think it's time for us to now hear from President Amy Gutman. Thank you. Jim, thank you so much. Welcome back to Penn, everyone. Great to see you all here. No one, no one has minted a higher standard of alumni engagement and service to Penn than the gentleman I'm honored to call my captain and my friend, our trustee board chairman, Jim Reefy. Jim graduated from Penn in 1965, and he has been an alumni volunteer par excellence ever since. He has, not to put too fine a point on it, done it all. He has run class reunions, he's been the chair of class reunion committees, and he's served on the Penn Alumni Board and on the Penn Mask and Wig Task Force. I did my research on Jim. He's also been an inspiring and an energetic leader every step of the way. As board chairman, Jim has served happily on 15 committees, or at least mostly happily on 15 committees. That's pretty amazing. When your board chair gives Penn nothing less than his best, you want to do the same. And that is what leadership is all about. Jim has been a consummate leader. He's been giving Penn his best for 44 years, nonstop. This is his last alumni weekend as our board chair, but not his last alumni weekend. You just know from looking at Jim that he's good for at least 44 more years, and that's what we expect. So please join me in saluting Jim Reefy. Jim, stand up. 
up. <laughs> So my message to all of you is maintaining close ties to PEM is good for you. And for proof, I brought proof here today. And the proof is sitting in the first and second rows. I would ask you to join me in saluting our commencement parade marshal from the great class of 1934, Edna Coplin Warsaw, and Sidney Steiger, and Jay Furman from the great class of 1934. We have three members of our 75th reunion class here today. Please salute them. Stand up. Jay? really inspiring. <laughs> Anytime you return to campus, you probably find it comforting, as I do, to recognize so much unchanged at Penn. Locust Walk remains a beautiful and vibrant thoroughfare. Fisher Fine Arts Building simply glows in the evening. And the palestra, I can attest, still rocks. But I bet that you also find it exhilarating to see how much has changed. And I really want to talk about the changes. So much has changed over my first five years as president. We've accomplished, and it's a we who have accomplished this, so much more than I could have ever dreamt when I became Penn's president. And we began at a very, very strong high level. Um, we began implementing our Penn Compact to increase affordability, to strengthen interdisciplinary education, and to enhance our impact on our local community, society, and the world. In short, as I hope you've all memorized, we have been driven to achieve eminence under our Penn Compact by increasing access, by integrating knowledge, and by engaging locally and globally. And so I want to take this occasion to highlight some major landmarks of the past five years with you, beginning with access and our truly historic financial aid initiatives. Beginning this September, we will substitute grants for loans for all our undergraduate financial aid students. No loan packages for everybody. <laughs> That means that students from typical families with incomes less than $90,000 will pay no tuition and fees. Students from low-income families of $40,000 or less will come to Penn without having to have any financial burden. Now, one of those extraordinary students who is enrolling at Penn this fall on a full scholarship is Diana Bustos. She hails from Texas, and I want to um, read something that Diana sent to us on email right after she got in. By the way, Diana's mom is a personal home care aide. Her father is out of work now, like millions of other Americans who were once employed. Right after she was accepted, here's the note we got from Diana. My dad cried when I received word that I had been accepted at Penn. I had never seen my dad cry. You have renewed my parents' faith in life and reinforced the idea that this country is, in fact, full of possibilities, the everlasting American dream. I keep that note in my wallet wherever I go because I think it says it all about the impact that our financial aid policies have on families right here and now, even before the students graduate. To meet the full demonstrated financial need of all Penn undergraduates, we have increased our financial aid budget since 2004 by 52 percent. That means we've gone from $90 million a year for undergraduate financial aid to $137 million a year. That is 
on account, and you should have thought of the generosity of the Penn alumni and the success of our Making History campaign. We need more and more for financial aid so we can support students who otherwise couldn't come to Penn. So let me place these numbers in perspective. And let's have a little fun this morning. Let's play Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And this is the million dollar question. Are you ready? What was Penn's total operating budget in 1968, the year Apollo 8 orbited the moon? Now we're going to poll the audience. You are both the contestant and the audience here. Show of hands, was it A, $19 million? B, $136 million? C, $390 million? D, $1 billion? <laughs> OK, I take B as the consensus here, the majority. Is, that your, is B your final answer? <laughs> The correct answer is B, $136 million. Today, today, excluding Penn Medicine, our budget totals $2.6 billion. And with Penn Medicine, our budget is $5.4 billion. So to put it in perspective how much our financial aid means in historic perspective, it is as much as our budget, our total budget, was in 1968. Now, not only have we done everything we could possibly do to make Penn more accessible for our financial aid students, but in recognition that everybody is feeling the pinch these days, we also just announced the lowest tuition increase in 41 years. So that is a very important part of what we've accomplished on the first pillar of the Penn Compact, increasing access. And keeping Penn affordable allows us to educate the most talented, high-achieving students from all backgrounds. And they become leaders for all sectors of our society and the world. They come to Penn to learn from outstanding faculty. And our outstanding faculty cross 12 schools all located on one campus. And they excel in interdisciplinary research and teaching. Guided by the second principle of the Penn Compact, integrating knowledge, we have launched major initiatives to encourage greater collaboration across our schools and disciplines. In 2005, we established the PIC, Penn Integrates Knowledge Professorships. We have appointed extraordinary teacher scholars to fortify our interdisciplinary eminence. These eight PIC professors each have a joint appointment from two of our 12 wonderful schools. They inspire students and colleagues alike, and they're making history throughout the world. Let me take one, anthropologist and evolutionary geneticist Sarah Tishkoff. You may have noticed that Sarah and her research team have just published the largest study ever of African genetic diversity. It was featured on the front page of the Science Times, of the New York Times. They have recently captured worldwide headlines from BBC throughout the world and praise for pinpointing the birthplace of the human species. Let me quote a geneticist from the University of Michigan who wrote in Science Magazine, where the study was published, the following. These are his words. Wow, that's an exact quote. This data gives us raw material for understanding human evolution that we have never had before. We will soon announce two new PIC professors next month, and we expect to have many more in the years to come, because through a new $50 million neuroscience initiative, we will add five PIC professors to secure Penn's leadership in the brain science revolution. So, so far I've talked about our historic financial aid initiatives and our groundbreaking PIC appointments. 
Now I want to describe how we are transforming our absolutely beautiful campus. As you would guess, the economic downturn has forced many universities to freeze major building projects indefinitely, but not Penn. Because we have been strategic and because we have been financially prudent, we are moving full steam ahead to create the ultimate urban campus, adding green space and building state-of-the-art facilities. For starters, we are building the most integrated health complex in the world. Last summer, we opened the Ruth and Raymond Perlman Center for Advanced Medicine, which offers the finest cancer and health care. By the end of this year, we will open the world's largest proton therapy center, named for Ralph Roberts and his family. And next year, we will complete the integration of this whole complex with the Fisher Translational Research Center. That will convert lab discoveries into effective medical therapies. And what we're doing there is reversing the, tra the traditional bench to bedside medicine, and we're beginning with the problems of the patient at the bedside and going back to the bench. So what Mike Parmachek, one of our great heart surgeons, calls it is bedside to bench medicine. That is enabled to happen here because we have such an integrated healthcare system. This summer, a few months from now, we are opening a glorious new home for the Annenberg Public Policy Center, designed by the Pritzker Prize winning architect Fumihiko Maki. This building will house a spectacular open forum for public events on our central campus. We will complete a beautiful renovation of our antiquated music building by next year. Antiquated is the nicest word I could use for the present state of our music building. It is going to really be transformed into something beautiful. And we're also converting Franklin Field's Northern Arcade into the George A. Weiss Pavilion that will feature a fabulous fitness center and weight training room for our great scholar athletes. The most visible manifestation of our creation of the ultimate urban campus will be Penn Park. We're calling it Penn Park, but if there's anyone who wants to name <laughs> the whole, happy to have a private meeting with you afterwards. We, what we're doing is converting a 14-acre surface parking lot that I have publicly described with a four-letter word, ugly, um, into beautiful green space, into four athletic playing fields and recreational facilities. And what I want to show you here is last spring's rendering of the transformation of Penn Park from the ugly into the beautiful, which will take place in two years' time. Doesn't go quite that fast in real time. <laughs> Now, we're always on the move, I, I like to say, and our chairman likes to say, Penn is always on the move. So let me show you the latest design of Penn Park. We've actually improved on the last year's design. And as you can see from this latest design, we have put in elevated walkways and treetop berms, which will be elevated 20 feet above the athletic fields in order to offer views of the athletic fields and the courts below, as well as spectacular views of the river and center city, Philadelphia. So come back two years from now and see the results. You can take a look now. There are mounds of dirt and bulldozers pulling up the asphalt, and we will be greening Penn. 
And that leads me to the next very important accomplishment of the last five years. We are becoming the greenest urban campus in this country. Um, for the third year, For the, for the third year in a row, the EPA has recognized Penn as the leading purchaser of wind power among the nation's colleges and universities. Our emphasis on green power has the same impact of taking more than 25,000 cars off the road each year. And we also received the highest grade from the college and university report card on sustainability, the highest grade of any university in this country. Our faculty are doing wonderful things in this regard, and our students are as well. As we create Penn Park and reduce our carbon footprint, we continue to deepen our ties by making West Philadelphia an ever more vibrant neighborhood in which to live, work, and raise a family. Each year, we generate, as a university, over $6 billion of economic impact in and around our city of Philadelphia. We have directed more construction and purchasing contracts to minority and women-owned businesses than ever before in Penn's history. And we run an apprenticeship program now to bring more of our neighbors in West Philadelphia and Southwest Philadelphia into the skilled building trades. We also run a vibrant health clinic for entire families at the Sarah School in West Philadelphia. So we are committed to our West Philadelphia neighborhood and to the city of Philadelphia. We educate Penn students for leadership through community service. Last year, we were one of three universities nationwide to receive the presidential award from the Corporation of National and Community Service. We are funding an additional 400 community service opportunities among three nationally acclaimed programs that exist at Penn and really inspire our students to do more and more. The Netter Center for Community Partnerships, the Fox Leadership Center, and Civic House. If you know any Penn students, you are likely to have heard of these programs because they truly engage and inspire our students to be leaders in our community while they are here at Penn. We have also begun and enriched models for global engagement. Our university-wide partnership with Botswana has helped that country fight the AIDS pandemic while launching its first medical school. And last January, I traveled to China to sign agreements with two leading universities for creating new research collaborations. A great partner for me in that is here today in the audience, our dean of the Wharton School, Tom Robertson. Tom, would you stand up, please? <laughs> Tom and I met with more than 400 Penn alumni and parents at alumni events at Beijing and Shanghai. And as you know, Wharton has become a brand name in China, along with Penn. And we're basically really surging forward to have great partnerships in China with the strength that we're building on. And the enthusiasm of our alumni for Penn and their interest in staying connected with one another and to Penn were really inspiring. Our partnerships in China, both with universities and with alumni will continue to grow all the more on the basis of an announcement. I don't know if you heard it this morning, but one of our illustrious Penn alums, John Huntsman Jr., has just been tapped by President Obama to become the next ambassador to China. That is fabulous for John Huntsman and for Penn. John Huntsman is a graduate of the College of Arts and Sciences in International Politics. And as you know, his father um, is the great generous naming donor of the building in which we are now meeting, Huntsman Hall, and the chairman of Wharton's Board of Overseers. So we are on the move. And the movement is all up. As I have said to 
everybody who has been part of this great team. It is remarkable, but adversity is making us stronger. Because we are so focused on our strategic priorities and so financially prudent. Increasing access, integrating knowledge, and strengthening local and global engagement all serve one overarching goal, to educate great future leaders. And no trend better illustrates our rise to eminence and our momentum than the excellence, diversity, and accomplishments of our students and our faculty. Every entering class from 2005 onward has been ever more accomplished and diverse. Our students continue to win highly sought prizes and recognitions, including Rhodes, Gates, Marshall, and 68 Fulbright scholarships. Our faculty, 2,400 teachers and scholars, inspire these students. Since 2004, they have captured a larger and larger share of the world's top academic honors, including Guggenheim Fellowships and induction into the most prestigious learned societies. In 2004, we did not foresee the global economic crisis on the horizon. It is fair to say nobody did. Yet, there are two reasons why I am absolutely confident that Penn will emerge from this crisis an ever stronger university. First, as I've said, we have been strategic in our vision under the Penn Compact and prudent in our financial planning. The second reason is in this audience. It's you. It is the involvement and the engagement of our Penn alumni family is just what this doctor ordered. It is really, really important to make this university stronger. Not only have you turned out this weekend to show your loyalty and fondness of Penn, you've also given to Penn in record amounts to keep our aspirations sky high. And this is not hyperbole. In 2004, our undergraduate reunion classes gave $45 million in gifts to Penn. This year, seven reunion classes, including the class of 2009, have set new participation and fundraising records. And your total undergraduate reunion class gifts will pass the 80 million mark, nearly double the total of 2004. Well done. Thank you for that. We don't yet have all the numbers for the graduate reunion classes, but I am sure that the graduate reunion classes also will join the rest of our reunion classes in making history. So what have we learned this morning very quickly? We've got a bold, visionary plan for transformation. We've got momentum, and we've got you and a great alumni extended Penn family on our side to keep that momentum going. At the outset, I said that maintaining ties to Penn is good for you. It is also essential to Penn's vitality going forward. The more you stay involved with Penn in any way, the stronger Penn will grow. This is my fifth alumni weekend celebration. And I expect to see all of you here five years from now. Penn Park will be complete and we can celebrate the next momentous period in Penn's history, a glorious, an absolutely glorious history that you helped to make. So I conclude before taking your questions by thanking each and every one of you, and go Quakers. <laughs>and we're going to get a mic to you so other people can, can hear, hear you. Do we have any questions? Over here. And introduce yourself. Is this on? Oh. Hi, um, my name is Cynthia Wright. I'm in the class of 2008. So this is actually just my first reunion, ah. although I've been coming to them since I was born uh, with my family. So. <laughs> okay. um, so um, I've been participating in everything this weekend. Uh, absolutely love being here. And uh, you touched briefly on your sustainability efforts with the university. I was just curious um, what initiative, you know, what you've been doing uh, specifically during alumni weekend 
uh, to tackle the green initiative um, since you've been, you know, the university obviously uses a lot of resources, um, you know, right. over this. So <laughs> we, now we are being environmentally conscious in every event we put on. We're using recyclable bags. So those of you who, everyone got a bag with pen stuff in it. They're all recyclable. We're, everything we're using is recyclable. Um, for my alumni uh, honorary degree dinner, we're doing centerpieces that can be planted in pen gardens rather than thrown out. We're really doing more and more to be sustainable. The most important thing we've done this year that guarantees the future of sustainability was actually overseen by um, our Vice President for Facilities and Real Estate Services, Ann Papa George. On my request, she put together a university-wide sustainability group consisting of not only staff and administrators, but students and faculty. And they will present to me in September the final recommendations. I have already received their preliminary recommendations for all the things across the board that Penn can do to take us to the next level. So we're never going to stop making progress in this regard. It will be an, an ev what I call an evergreen goal. Hi, I'm Franklin Spire. I'm class of 69. Frank, why don't you, Franklin, stand up. Class of 69. My wife, Carol Novick Spire, is class of 80. <laughs> it was very interesting to hear of your initiative uh, with China. Could you give us a little more background yes, on that? Yes, sure. Please. So what we've decided to do with regard to global partnerships is to be very strategic and focused. We, there are a thousand flowers blooming around our faculty and students in study abroad and research and so on. But we've decided that China is a very important place for us to broaden our partnerships. So what we've done is the following. We've signed two memoranda of understanding with major universities in China for our faculty and students to have collaborative research and teaching projects. And ultimately, there'll be exchanges and internships in specific areas. Let me give you one example. Um, in Beijing, Tsinghua University, we have something called the T.C. Chan Center for Environmentally Sustainable Building. And we want to be a leader in environmental sustainability. And there we have faculty from both Tsinghua and our Penn School of Design, and ultimately it will be more schools, working on the most efficient environmental sustainable designs. And as you know, until we get the cost of carbon being carbon friendly down, it's not going to be feasible to move forward in as quick and efficient a way as we want to. So that's an example of what we're doing. A second part of this is really building and enriching our alumni network in China. We have, I think we were all surprised at the number of Penn alumni who want to be connected to Penn and are in China. And we want to increase that. So Wharton and the university are working together in ways that we can build that alumni network. And that will help everybody because, it, and the new Chinese, you know, US ambassador to China is going to catapult us forward in that regard as well. Yes. The gentleman here, yeah. My name is Jonathan Tannenbaum. I'm a 2006 graduate of the college, and somebody who follows and writes about Penn sports on a regular basis, as I think you know. Um, I'm curious as to what your view is at the moment of the state. You talked about alumni engagement with the school. You talked about the palestra still, still rocking, were the words that you used. I'm curious as to what you think the current state of the current undergraduates under engagement with the university and building that sense of community is, not only through athletics, where I think a lot of the people who went to games this year saw a decrease in attendance, but in other areas, not just athletics, but across yeah. the campus. Yeah. There, let me begin with athletics, because um, I think it's a very important part of our community building. And there, um, I think there are three things important. One is that we 
are um, building fabulous new athletic space and recreational space for our campus. And whereas now I can talk about the Palestra Rocky and Franklin Field, I hope I'll see some of you at commencement on Franklin Field, it's wonderful. It is not well integrated into the campus and our new Penn Connects plan is going to transform the campus and bring athletic and recreational space as really a central part of the beauty of our campus. And I can't um, overemphasize the importance of that transformation, which is going to happen in two years' time. Um, there'll be a second college green in front of Franklin Field and the, and the Palestra. And it will just be a spectacular walkways as well. That's number one. Number two are athletic. Athletic teams, I really want our basketball team to get better and get better soon. I can tell you I'm a big basketball fan. It wasn't fun at the Palestra this year, to, um, especially at the Palestra. We did better away than we did at home. That was terrible. Um, so I want to see that change, and I predict it will. Um, and the th and I, I encourage our students to come out, not only to athletic events, but to athletic events, to a cappella group, performing arts. We have this wonderful Platt Performing Arts Center. It is also rocking. And it's rocking with students who are great artists in their own right, performing artists. We have a wonderful museum of anthropology and archaeology, and we're working to make that more accessible um, to our students. So I think we have to recognize that there are so many things going on at Penn in any given day that it is very difficult for our students, let alone the president, to be at all of the things. But we really want and we are you know, encouraging more and more engagement. And the third, the third part of this is that the Penn spirit of really being leaders of student-led groups is something that's getting stronger and stronger. And part of what any single group is seeing is that there are many other um, things to do at any given time. So that's some of what we're, what we're doing. And there's a lot more to come. Yes, over there. Hi, my name is Earl Varney, and I'm Wharton graduate, 25th anniversary uh, alumni class. Uh, class of 84. Uh, my concern has to do with what I call the brain drain. Uh, I made the observation when I graduated 25 years ago that most of my colleagues went to New York for investment banking jobs or overseas or other places and I, and I see that continue to this day. And so as one of the few that actually stays and lives and works in the Philadelphia area, I'm wondering what Penn is doing to promote more synergy with companies in the area and try to, uh, to get their graduates, both on the undergraduate level and uh, graduate program level, to actually stay and work in, in this area? Our students love being at Penn, and they don't want to leave Philadelphia either. And to the extent that Philadelphia creates more jobs and becomes a more job and business friendly city, I know that more and more Penn students will stay here. It is one of the most affordable cities in the Northeast Corridor. We now have a mayor who's a Penn graduate who cannot fail. He will succeed. He's already brought the crime rate down in, in Philadelphia, and he's given all signs of really being determined to carry through on his three platforms, lower crime, improve education and improve job opportunities. And that's what it's going to take. I can tell you that our students want to stay here. My name is Tom Vincent. Wait, wait, wait. You need a microphone, Tom. Oh, okay. There you go. My name is Tom Vincent, Wharton graduate class of 56, and I'm also the editor of the uh, Emeritus Society newsletter, which goes to those of us who've been out for 50 years and are still here. Uh, in the fall edition, we have a column called Campus Catch-Up, and I'm wondering what you could tell us about something, say, by uh, Labor Day that might be either photogenic or something that really has captured your enthusiasm and interest that we could feature. Annenberg Public Policy Center will open this summer, and you could feature the new 
forum, which we're calling after the Greek word agora, which will really be a place for p big events on, on campus. The other thing which you can feature every single fall is the class of 2013 is once again the most academically accomplished and most diverse class ever. 44% of the incoming class are students of color and their average, the whole incoming class, the average SAT scores of this class have gone up 16 points over last year's, which has gone up 15 points. This is an average of over 2,100. Now, if that's just something that never ceases to excite me. We get every week emails and letters from our incoming students who will make anybody who is a graduate alum of this great university proud because they are so happy, indeed thrilled, to come to Penn and they are so grateful for the fact that you all have made it possible for them to come to Penn. So I would urge you to put something in your newsletter about how the new incoming class is benefiting from what all of the alumni at Penn have made possible. We are stronger than ever before, and we will continue to do more and more. Thank you very, very much. I think so. Thank you. We have a consensus then. Penn continues to be on the move. Um, <laughs> and right now, I'd like you all to move out to Locust Walk, where the parade is going to begin. We've changed the schedule, as you all noted, and the parade is going to be before lunch. So we'll see you all outside. OK, great. Good. That was great. <laughs>